Hi again, everybody. We're going to discuss the congenital infections here. Uh, actually, we're going to discuss most of them. We're going to discuss what commonly falls under the torch infections, uh, and then we'll discuss a few other infections uh, on a later uh, lecture. So we're going to talk about uh, five infections here that are usually classified uh, as torch. Uh, and that is uh, toxoplasmosis, syphilis, rubella, CMV, and HSV. Now, syphilis falls under the O because it's other, and you could take other diseases, other infections, and put it under other as well. So you could take varicella, group B, strep, HIV, hepatitis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. You could put all of those under, under other, but I'm just going to talk about syphilis uh, here for other. So we're going to talk about five different infections. In another section, we're going to talk about congenital varicella, group B strep, which is the number one cause of neonatal sepsis, and then some special considerations for infants that are born to mothers that have uh, certain illnesses, some of them chronic. So congenital toxoplasmosis is an infection with Toxoplasma gondii, which is a protozoa, and it's acquired through maternal infection. Now, in normal immunocompetent people, children, adults, infection with toxoplasmosis is typically subclinical. So you can uh, get a cat, brand new, bring it home, tend to its kitty litter, and you can get a toxoplas get infected with toxoplasmosis, and you don't even know it, uh, because for most people, this is uh, taken care of by your immune system right away. Now, on the other hand, there are certain people who uh, are affected, uh, of course, fetuses, uh, which we're going to talk about, but also people who are immunocompromised, particularly HIV/AIDS patients, uh, once they uh, get to the more severe stages of their disease. The source of Toxoplasma gondii is most commonly through cat feces in the U.S., handling of cat litter, and that's mostly because we don't eat undercooked meat anymore. We understand that undercooked meat has risks, but if you are eating steak tartare, then uh, that's another risk factor then. Uh, fetal damage is most likely to happen if the infection is acquired during the second through sixth month of gestation. And the manifestations, you're going to see with these torch infections that a lot of these come up a lot. So intrauterine growth retardation, small baby for gestational age, jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, these come up in most of them. Uh, I'm going to try to boldface and point out the ones that are unique uh, or more pointing uh, to these individual diseases we're talking about. So intrauterine growth retardation, small for gestational age, jaundice, jaundice hepatosplenomegaly, rash, uh, hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus would probably be a little bit more specific to toxoplasmosis. Uh, microcephaly, and then uh, cataracts, chorioretinitis, visual impairment, and possibly even seizures as well. 70 to 90 percent of infants are who are infected with toxoplasmosis are actually going to be subclinical at birth, but they may go on to develop later uh, sequelae, which include learning disabilities, mental retardation, and visual impairment. Uh, so you have a child who's fine at birth, but then they come in at three or four years of age and they're not able to read or they're not able to talk or there's stuff going on. Congenital toxoplasmosis, looking back at it, could be could have been a cause. So for diagnosis, if you suspect a baby has toxo, then the best first step is to get antibody titers. And you should get this from both the blood and the CSF, uh, as, as well as cultures. Uh, but the titers are going to be what comes back quickest, and uh, that's going to uh, guide your diagnosis. Another way that you can, uh, I suppose, I don't know if it would really diagnose it, but it can really point you towards congenital toxo, is by getting an MRI. And it's certainly indicated in any patient uh, who has congenital toxo, and I would order it even in a patient who I suspect has congenital toxo, because its findings uh, will give you a lot of uh, 
a lot of confidence in your diagnosis. And the findings that you'll see are diffuse intracranial calcifications. And this is going to stand in contrast to CMV, which we'll talk about later, which has a different pattern of intracranial calcifications. And then an ophthalmologic exam uh, should also be performed uh, to look for chorioretinitis, and that's typically going to be done by a pediatric ophthalmologist. For treatment, it's pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine, just like in adults. And we'll also add leucovorin because the, uh, the I believe it's a sulfa drug, has a uh, tendency to suppress bone marrow. Uh, so we give leucovorin as well. If the mom were to be exposed to toxoplasmosis during the pregnancy, so let's say that she goes to a friend's house and she walks into a room and boom, there's kitty litter. Or, uh, or the friend is changing the kitty litter. Or let's say that the mom is a secretary or a veterinary technician in a, in a vet's office, and she really can't get away from, from cat feces uh, as much as she tries. What we can do for her to reduce the risk of transmission is give her spiromycin during her pregnancy. That does reduce, but it doesn't eliminate the risk of transmission. So what you see that I keep here in the pink, these are more OB notes, uh, but you know it's kind of hard to leave out the OB stuff when you're talking about the newborn babies because we're kind of at a junction here. So here's the cataracts. Uh, these look like just regular old cataracts, but these happen to be in a child with congenital toxo. This is an example of microcephaly. So with microcephaly, it's really the top of the skull that's abnormal. The face is normal size. Uh, and as this child grows, his face will grow, but the skull won't grow uh, proportional. And then here's those diffuse calcifications. So they're all over in the brain matter. And this is my cat. Uh, he died a couple years ago. Uh, but he lived a good long life. He was 20 when he died. We got him actually right after my sister was born. So that might have had something to do with it. Okay, congenital syphilis. This is an infection with the spirochete bacteria Trypanema pallidum. And this occurs in babies whose mothers either acquired syphilis during pregnancy or they had already had syphilis prior to the pregnancy, uh, but they weren't adequately treated or they weren't treated at all. And the manifestations of congenital syphilis early on uh, include jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, Coombs negative, hemolytic anemia, which you may mistake for something else, uh, snuffles, that's a really specific uh, manifestation of uh, congenital syphilis. I'll show you a picture of that. Muco mucocutaneous lesions of the palms and soles, that's on the more specific end, and periostitis. The problem with some of these things, even though they're specific, is noticing them. So snuffles you might just think is, is just the baby having a snotty nose. Uh, you know, and mucocutaneous lesions of the palms and soles can be confused with uh, congenital herpes. So uh, really the, the problem can be putting them together. But if you see uh, several of them at the same time, it, it's a little bit easier. And also, we always test mothers during their prenatal, uh, at some point during their, their prenatal visits, for all of these congenital uh, diseases. Uh, so uh, if you ever suspect congenital toxo or congenital syphilis or congenital herpes, it's always useful to go back and look into the mother's uh, prenatal visit uh, uh, diagnostics. Uh, but I suspect on the USMLE they're going to want you to diagnose it uh, by symptoms alone or at least uh, choose what tests to do. Uh, so uh, later on, for congenital syphilis, as these kids develop, they will develop uh, Hutchinson's teeth, uh, and that's just this sort of peg-like tooth uh, that all come in. They have a very characteristic uh, uh, look to them. Saddle nose, which is because of a collapse of the uh, of the uh, of the nasal bridge. Frontal bossing, which is a, uh, a, a 
a very prominent forehead, uh, knee synovitis, interstitial keratitis, and deafness. So some of those later characteristics that develop are a lot more specific to congenital syphilis than some of the stuff you see early on. For diagnosis, the best initial test is a VDRL RPR. Uh, that's more of a screening test. Uh, and you'll get this both of the serum and of the CSF because we are also concerned for neurosyphilis. Positive tests should be confirmed with FTA ABS, and that is the most accurate test for syphilis. Uh, regardless of whether they're, sympt they're symptoms at all, though, if a baby is born to a mother who ever had syphilis and wasn't definitively treated or they were treated with something other than penicillin, you should always test these babies, even if they don't have symptoms. So really, it's most important to know the maternal history. Because if you know the maternal history, it doesn't even matter if the baby has symptoms, you're going to be testing the baby. Uh, and then the treatment is, like for pretty much everybody, penicillin G. But you're going to use a higher dose if there's CSF disease. And then, of course, mom should be treated too. So these are the snuffles. And uh, beware of this fluid. This is not, uh, this is not snot. This is a broth of spirochetes. So you will want to handle this very carefully. Uh, here's a palmar and solar rash that you can get with congenital syphilis. Here's Hutchinson's teeth. So you can see the difference. I don't really know what to call these other than kind of peg-like. You can also get these mulberry molars. So this is kind of a normal molar down here. And you can see these are a little, the texture is a little bit different. And they're supposed to look like mulberries. These are mulberries here. Uh, you can also have rigods. Rigod, rigods are these fine lines around the uh, angle of the mouth. And they get worse as you get older. So here's a woman with a lot of rigods. I don't know. I don't think it's totally specific to syphilis but uh, it is a characteristic of, of congenital syphilis. And then she had plastic surgery. This is frontal bossing. You can definitely see that this baby's forehead is prominent. And you can also see the saddle nose deformity here. And here's the saddle nose deformity. These are saber shins. These are also seen in congenital syphilis. So, uh, Got a similar shape to a saber, that sort of uh, convex shape. Okay, congenital rubella. So this is an infection with the rubella virus. Uh, congenital anomalies typically occur if the mother contracts the virus during, uh, particularly during the first trimester. And this is a lot less common in the U.S. Uh, compared to toxo, compared to syphilis, uh, because we mass immunize people against rubella in the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, however, if you haven't been paying attention to the news lately, particularly in the United States, we have been having a measles and mumps uh, outbreak, and that is probably due to this faux science and this terrible misconception that vaccines are ineffective, or they cause autism, or they cause other problems, that they contain mercury. None of those are true. <laughs> and so, uh, but the problem is people aren't getting vaccinated, they're not getting their kids vaccinated, and so particularly when we're talking about women not getting vaccinated, well, you get exposed to measles or mumps or rubella, maybe okay for you, you might be fine, but baby is going to suffer. So the manifestations of congenital rubella. Again, we see some of these similar manifestations we see everywhere else with the uh, small baby, the paddosplenomegaly, jaundice. Uh, in this case, they get a papular rash that uh, is often characterized as the blueberry muffin rash. And all of this is due to is, uh, is uh, both 
hematopoiesis that's going on, plus uh, you have uh, these um, little papules. Uh, so this is causing uh, this blueberry muffin rash. Now, we generally jump to associate blueberry muffin rash with rubella, congenital rubella, but it can also be uh, associated with congenital CMV. So don't don't get a knee-jerk uh, diagnosis of rubella just because you hear the word blueberry muffin rash. Uh, it's also associated with cataracts, uh, retinopathy, and then this one's a big one, congenital heart defects, particularly PDA. So if you hear that machinery murmur, uh, that murmur of that constant flow through the patent ductus arteriosus, that's a big one to check up. That is really pointing towards congenital rubella, but they can also have other congenital heart defects, particularly septal defects. Uh, and then sensory neural deafness is another common one here. Now be sure to ask the mom about any possible, well, first of all, ask her if she's been vaccinated, and if so, how long it's been since she was vaccinated. Uh, check in her charts for her rubella titers. She should have had those taken. Uh, and then if those are suspicious, then make sure to ask her, uh, did you have any possible infection during your pregnancy that may have been rubella? Like, did you ever have a rash? Did you ever have joint pain? Did you ever have fever? Sort of like this mono-looking uh, illness. And if the answer is yes, then we need to document that. Uh, the best initial diagnostic test for congenital rubella is rubella titers. It's also incredibly helpful to know the mom's immune status against rubella too, because if mom's immune to rubella, then you should be looking at something else. And then it can't be understated that these babies also need to be sent off for an echocardiogram, uh, one, to diagnose the PDA, because that points you towards congenital rubella, but also because they can have other congenital heart defects uh, in the setting of congenital rubella. And then they also need an ophthalmologic exam uh, because of their association with retinopathy. The treatment for congenital rubella, unlike these other torch diseases, is really just supportive. There's no treatment for congenital rubella. So here's an example of the blueberry muffin rash. It doesn't always look like a blueberry muffin, but uh, this, is, this is what they mean. So take it or leave it. I, I'm not a big fan of the uh, comparison. I don't think it always looks like a blueberry muffin. Plus, I like blueberry muffins. I don't like to think I'm eating babies while I'm uh, having breakfast. Okay, congenital CMV. So this is an infection with the cytomegalovirus, and a vast majority of the population carries the cytomegalovirus. And because we, again, this is another thing like toxoplasmosis. In most people, most of us are immunocompetent, we get toxoplasmosis, we get CMV, we may have a little bit of achy pains, but it's nothing that we think about or go to the doctor for or maybe we even notice. And so we wind up getting it and we make the antibodies and we don't even realize it. So most of us actually carry CMV and the antibodies and so we're already immune. And if we get pregnant, well not me, but if a woman gets pregnant, then she can pass those antibodies to her fetus, and therefore the baby is going to be safe. The problem comes if a pregnant woman who has never been exposed to CMV before becomes exposed to CMV for the first time during her pregnancy, particularly in the first half. Now, because CMV doesn't cause any uh, symptoms in immunocompetent people, it's very difficult to know where CMV is. So it can, you can see how this can be a, a really big pain in the butt for pregnant women who haven't been exposed to CMV. So what you want to do immediately, uh, and the, I, I, it's hard to talk about this without talking about OB a little bit, but you need to make sure that you know whether or not the mother uh, has CMV antibodies because if she doesn't, it means she probably has not been exposed to it and so she needs to be aware of that. And there's various ways you can, uh, various actions you can do to prevent CMV, none of which are medical, it's mostly like washing hands and stuff, uh, to prevent the possibility of getting CMV, but uh, 
the risk is always going to be there. So the manifestations of congenital CMV, the baby is going to typically look ill uh, at birth or within hours of birth, and that kind of sets this one apart from the other ones. The baby's going to be small for gestational age, may have microcephaly, jaundice, a rash, and that looks it really looks like the blueberry muffin rash uh, that you see in congenital rubella. So uh, it's, that's a big reason why I don't like uh, that classification because you know you can get rashes in all of these kind of. Uh, and then they can also get sensory neural deficits, uh, optical problems, and then long-term sequelae, which include learning disabilities and mental retardation. The best way to diagnose this, though, regardless of how the baby looks, is to get a urine CMV and an MRI. Uh, and so uh, if you have an ill baby, uh, a baby that's ill within hours of birth, you should always think of congenital CMV, especially if the mother had never been exposed to CMV. Um, but another thing that's good to get is that MRI, because that MRI will give you a very characteristic uh, uh, demonstration, and that will be periventricular calcifications. And this is different from toxoplasmosis. Remember, toxoplasmosis was, uh, was, was disseminated uh, 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 calcifications. They were all over the place. These are concentrated around the ventricles, and I'll show you a picture of that. The treatment for congenital CMV infection, once it's, uh, once it's been diagnosed with the urine CMV, is gancyclovir, and that's shown to reduce the progression to deafness, but it does not necessarily reduce the, uh, the disease itself as far as the possibility of developing uh, cognitive defects. So here's those periventricular calcifications. They're not diffuse, they're more centered around the ventricles. This is a really helpful test to get. But remember, your best test is your urine CMV. Okay, finally, the congenital herpes infection. So this is an infection with the herpes simplex virus, particularly an infection that uh, is causing or has caused genital herpes in the mother. So if the mother has a history of cold sores, oral herpes lesions, we're not as concerned because the baby's not going to be coming out through the mouth. Uh, if she's had a history of genital herpes, we're concerned because she may uh, develop those sores again. Uh, or she could have them while she's uh, delivering, and so that's, that's a, a problem. So herpes lesions are very, very, very contagious uh, for anybody uh, with skin-to-skin -skin contact. So a big red flag, if the mother is experiencing her first HSV outbreak, that's a problem because the sores from herpes are more contagious uh, well, no, let me, let me say that uh, differently. When the mother is experiencing her first HSV outbreak, she does not have the antibodies uh, right away. So if she's experiencing a secondary outbreak, a, a second outbreak um, from the same infection, then uh, she's already got those antibodies, and those antibodies can be passed to baby. And so baby's disease will be a little bit uh, less severe. Uh, but if, if she's eight months along in her pregnancy and she develops her first uh, genital herpes outbreak uh, in, her, in her birth canal, that's, that's a big problem. Uh, so on that note, uh, one of the ways to avoid this is to do a cesarean delivery, and that's for any mother with an active infection or any mother with a history of herpes who has genital lesions that might be herpes. Not all genital lesions are herpes. Uh, not all genital lesions are even infectious, but uh, if, if she has a history of herpes and she has genital lesions, that's enough suspicion to do a cesarean delivery. But if she has a history of herpes and she doesn't have any lesions, then uh, and you need to look, you can't just ask her, uh, then uh, you don't necessarily need to do a cesarean delivery. I believe 70% of women uh, are asymptomatic but do have active herpes lesions uh, in, in their birth canal. So you have to actually look.
Uh, manifestations. So 40% of babies who contract herpes through the birth canal will have localized eye, mouth, and skin lesions. This tends to present in the first couple of weeks. So it'll look just like, it'll look just like herpes vesicles. 30% uh, will go on to develop CNS problems, so this is herpes encephalitis, uh, apnea, and seizures. So anytime a baby comes in with encephalitis, bulging fontanelles, you need to consider herpes. And then uh, disseminated disease is what is mostly feared. Uh, that will show multi-organ disease, septic presentation. This tends to present shortly after birth. Uh, so, obviously, when a baby presents septic, we treat them empirically, but you should uh, be looking uh, for herpes uh, in addition to other things. So, the best initial diagnostic test is going to be an HSV PCR, which should be obtained in the serum and in the CSF. Uh, as far as for step three, if you have, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, if you have an ill or septic appearing baby, the initial treatment is going to be broad-spectrum antibiotics because what's the number one cause of neonatal sepsis? It's group B strep. So you're treating for group B strep, uh, but you have to keep everything uh, into consideration, uh, especially disseminated HSV infection. If you have, uh, if, if you have any of the, uh, the premonitions, uh, particularly based on uh, mother's history, uh, baby's history, and so forth. Uh, so what you'll want to do then is uh, make sure you have a CSF for, uh, to, to do a PCR and, uh, for HSV. And the reason you're getting a CSF is because uh, ill babies will have uh, CNS-related uh, disease, uh, especially if it's disseminated. Uh, so uh, in addition, though, you should also get a serum uh, PCR for uh, herpes as well. Uh, so uh, once you've confirmed uh, the diagnosis uh, of CNS or disseminated uh, herpes simplex infection, then you can start acyclovir. Uh, but acyclovir is going to be given for any of these manifestations, cutaneous, CNS, or disseminated. It's acyclovir, 60 milligrams per kilogram per day. Don't need to know that for the test. The only reason I included it in here is that this is a huge... Uh, whopping amount of acyclovir we're giving these babies. Uh, so this is uh, sort of how those lesions look. They're vesicular. They look a lot different than those purpuric lesions that uh, you see in some of the other diseases. So they break. And you'll particularly uh, note these lesions uh, uh, around the eyes and the mouth as well, uh, because that's sort of what's, well, I mean, there's a, lo there's a lot of parts of the body that are coming into contact, but what comes into contact first? It's the face. That's typically how the baby comes up. So, all right, I believe that's everything. Oh, no, we have a recap. <sighs> all right, forgot I put this in there. Okay, so since we went over a bunch of information, I just want to uh, go over some of these uh, and then the special features uh, that you may see just for high yield stuff. So uh, toxoplasmosis, special features are going to be uh, hydrocephalus, uh, then those generalized calcifications on MRI, you'll get toxotiters, uh, and then definitive treatment is pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. Make sure you add on leucovorin. If you are on step three and you don't add leucovorin onto that, you will get a mark taken off. Uh, syphilis, palm and sole rashes, periostitis, uh, but uh, along with all these other things that we see in these torch diseases like intrauterine growth retardation, small for gestational age, um, and then of course uh, the mother will be positive for syphilis as well. For diagnosis, we get a VDRL RPR, uh, and then that'll be confirmed with an FTA uh, ABS. But the, your initial diagnosis is a screening test, and the definitive diagnosis or definitive treatment here is penicillin G. Make sure you get a uh, CSF analysis as well, because if you have uh, neurosyphilis, you're going to be uh, augmenting your penicillin G dosage. For rubella, we typically see cataracts, deafness, and heart defects. 
Remember, particularly PDA, so all of these babies with suspected congenital rubella should be getting an echocardiogram. Uh, rubella titers are used for diagnosis here. This is just supportive. So remember rubella, particularly in a mother who has not been immunized. Uh, CMV is going to show you those periventricular calcifications on MRI. Uh, these babies tend to be more ill earlier on. Uh, they may show, show thrombocytopenia uh, on labs. You'll get a urine CMV PCR uh, for that and treat them with gancyclovir. And for herpes, congenital herpes, uh, you'll see skin vesicles, especially around the eyes and mouth in 40% of these babies. And then in some cases, they can have encephalitis or septic appearance. Uh, for this, you're going to get uh, HSV, PCR, and culture. Uh, you'll want to get that both of the uh, serum and the cerebrospinal fluid, again, because we want to know uh, is there, uh, is there a, uh, is this just in the skin or is this, uh, has this gone on to, uh, affect the, uh, the, uh, central nervous system and beyond. Uh, so we give a cyclovir for these babies as well. So any questions, go ahead and comment below as you